Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be with you today. I wish to begin by saying to you, I would like you as this audience, made up primarily of South Africans, to be proud of yourselves as South Africans. You have done something incredible. I am not seeking to please you when I say to you the whole world wants to know South Africans. They want to know what does it take to take on this very difficult challenge. As a country that is right at the bottom of the African continent, that is a small economy compared to big economies, and that really should not have the cheek to challenge anyone. Now, this challenge does not begin today. And so before I speak about the ICJ, Farsiha, with your permission, I just want to say, I thought I was the only speaker here. And so I prepared a whole speech, but I'm putting it aside because Comrade Adam said we must be very brief. And I'm not used to brevity, but I will be. So in terms of uh, what does it mean? The ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is the highest global court. It is one of the institutions of the United Nations body of institutions. A very significant body because it has the right to adjudicate on a wide range of matters that are set out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in international humanitarian conventions and protocols, in a range of instruments that govern international law. And let me make it clear, what we're talking about today is international law. And I should have said, while Naledi is the one who's speaking, the leader on this issue is Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa. And I should say too, the ANC didn't support, didn't start supporting Palestine yesterday. It didn't start when we went to the ICJ. African National Congress has always stood with the people of Palestine in their struggle against oppression and injustice. It's not something new. It's not a new thing. Some people might be discovering it just today but we have always been in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Some of our freedom fighters were trained by freedom fighters of Fatah and the Palestine Liberation Organization. And so we will not desert Palestine until freedom and their state equal with us, we will continue to support their just cause. This is a very important point. <clears throat> A second point is, as South Africa, in terms of our international policy, we believe in what is called multilateralism. We believe in a multipolar world. We don't believe in unipolarity, that there are one or two powerful governments in the world who think they can tell the rest of us what we should do. We don't support that. In our view, the premier institution of multilateralism, which should oversee our rights and our access to human rights, is the United Nations and no other body. So we're very clear on multilateralism and the premier global institution for humanity, the UN. We are against establishing institutions that displace the United Nations. We're against unilateral sanctions 
by one powerful country against countries of the world without recourse to the United Nations, which should be the one that sets sanctions. So I want to make these things very clear. This is a difficult world we're grappling with. It's a global set of challenges that all of us have to understand and engage with. So we said, as government, we cannot, as South Africa, that came through the struggle against apartheid, tolerate what is being done to the people of Palestine. We had at that time already observed for over a month the murder of children, of women, of old men, of youths. And we said, we can't sit silently by. What is available to us? We were one of the first countries in partnership with Gift of the Givers to send aid through Egypt to the suffering people of Gaza. <clears throat> Some of our aid got through, but I know a large amount of our aid is still stuck at the Rafa border because Israel is not allowing it in. So we are now going to approach others to ensure that we are able to get that aid in. But we thought, as government, let us test the most challenging international instrument to see whether it would act in terms of our case against Israel. I want to confirm to you the decision to go to the ICJ was taken by the cabinet of the Republic of South Africa. It was a government decision. We had had many, many people indicating government needs to do something, government must act. And in fact, we'd already referred Premier Netanyahu to the ICC for the ICC to actually investigate the conduct of the government of Israel and to do as they did with President Putin and issue a warrant for Prime Minister Netanyahu. We are still waiting for that to happen. But once we presented the memo to our cabinet, the cabinet immediately agreed that we must go to the ICJ in terms of the Convention on the Crime and Punishment of Genocide. So, Following the decision of 8th December, we asked everyone in cabinet to say nothing and to leave it to Durko and Justice to do the work first. Because we know, you know, when there are leaks, then it gets to other people and they put all kinds of barriers in your ability to act. So, alhamdulillah, everybody was quiet and never spoke about it. I must confess that one day I was in the Boer Cup at a meeting of our Muslim community in the Boer Cup. And there were some ladies who were very revolutionary. I'm sure they are BDS members, because BDS is revolutionary. And they were shouting at me, Naledi, action, Naledi, action. And this was after the cabinet meeting. And I knew in my heart that we were preparing but I couldn't defend the government. I, there was nothing I could say, because I told everybody, let's keep quiet till we're ready. So I took the ladies, they punched a bit and everything, and I just knew in my heart, and I was saying, Allah, I know you're listening, you know what we're preparing. So we worked throughout December. It was our legal team, and especially the DG of Justice, and our DG, Zane Dango, who did the hard work. <laughs> and of course, the initiator was Minister Lamula, and the executioner is me. Uh, so, uh, so we were working throughout December, but the papers are prepared by lawyers because it's a court case. Uh, all I did was they would send something, and I say, you missed out and you didn't spell this properly, and so on. But uh, we, we got the documents done. 
Then we sent them to our principal, the president of the ANC, President Ramaphosa. He took a few days and I was getting worried because there's a deadline. So I kept sending him SMSs, President, we need the document, we've got to finalize it. I have to send it in by such and such date in December. Fortunately, Zain Dango is Muslim and myself, so we could spend December doing that. So we were able to work on it, and 29th of December, on the date of the deadline, we sent it in. Importance is, one, you're approaching a global international institution. Very important. So what does it do? What you table before it is tabled before the world. It's tabled before the world. When we sat there in The Hague, the feeling in my heart was for the first time, Israel's impunity is visible to the world. So the importance was the issues related to our belief that genocide is being committed. Those issues and what genocide means were on the table, described by our legal team. You would have seen with the Israeli legal team, they couldn't respond to those issues. We tabled all the matters and of course, it's a court case. We don't want to ruin our court case. But here's the process. We had to wait for their decision. We wanted an urgent decision on provisional measures only. Not on the genocide, because you don't deal with it quickly. It's a whole process. But on the provisional measures, we wanted the court to say, stop this killing. Make sure aid gets in. And all the nine that we asked for, they granted seven of the nine, and we, we feel vindicated. Primarily because in Israel's case, its responding case, one, they said they have no dispute with South Africa. We have a dispute with them. <laughs> they said they don't have a dispute, we don't have a dispute, and therefore, in terms of the convention, we cannot bring a case. But we had written to them to say we are going to the ICJ and what the reasons are. And they unfortunately wrote back to us saying they disagree. So there was a dispute. And the court said there's a dispute. You're shaking your head. You disagree. I'm talking facts, not making it up. The gentleman is going like this. So the second thing was the issue of genocide because it's a very serious allegation to make. To commit genocide is a very serious matter. And so the court has to consider all the issues extremely carefully. Hence the final decision is not made immediately. But what the court does, they look at what you have submitted and they make a decision on what they call plausibility. Is it plausible that genocide is indeed underway as South Africa claims? So when we were in the court, the first part of their statement was accepting there's a dispute. The third paragraph, and they, you know, they took long, you know, lawyers reading all their things. But when they came to the third paragraph, they then spoke to the matters relevant to genocide and the sections we had quoted of the convention. And they said they find that we'd got dispute, we got plausibility, and the lawyers were breaking my hands by that time <laughs> because they knew that the court was taking our case seriously. So the important, uh, uh, the importance of this case is first, you're with a global international body, and when you have a global institution, for all countries, whether they agree with you or not, to reject what that court says places you in a very invidious position. 
Remember as well that if you are associated with the commitment of genocide, the committing of genocide, you yourself become a party of the guilty parties. This is why you would see that certain leaders are now being sent out, powerful leaders. After telling us we are ridiculous in the public domain, they're now saying Israel must respect the international court. Now, they've changed because next thing you are implicated and you have to come before the court. So that is, in, in sum, that is the importance. Then what, where do we go from here? All we were dealing with in, initially is do we have a case and can we have provisional measures? You know that Israel has ignored the provisional measures. They've submitted the report. That's the only part they've acted on. We are preparing a response to their report. I don't have to tell you what it is. You can guess uh, what's happening there. But the court has reiterated that Israel has a legal obligation as a state party to the convention to act on what the court has set out. So the legal points are established. We're now going to move, once the court gives us a date, to what is called the merits of the case. Comrade Anva would be explaining this much better than I. The merits would go into the key issues of whether there is indeed a genocide. And it's clear. If I deny you food, if I deny you water, if I deny you energy, my intention is to kill you. If I tell you move to point B, and as you move I kill you, my intention is to wipe you out. If you move to point B, then I tell you back to point A, and I kill you as you move, my intention is genocide. So for the African National Congress, this is a clear issue of an abuse of human rights, and it's something that we cannot accept or tolerate, and as the African National Congress and this government, we are resolute that we will continue to pursue this case. Thank you.